Welcome back to the Gillette Health Podcast, where we give you tools to develop a balanced approach for health. I'm Dr. Kyle Gillette. And I'm James O'Hara, nurse practitioner. And today we have a highly anticipated podcast, hair loss and hair loss updates. So we talked about virtually every mainstream treatment for hair loss in our previous podcast. And today we're going to go through updates. So what things are in developments, stages of trials, uh, products that are even commercially available at this point that we did not mention in the first Mm -hmm. podcast. So starting off, we have one that's called uh, Cosme RNA or Cosmerna. Uh, Apparently this is produced out of South Korea and it suppresses androgen receptor gene expression. And this is a theme, the androgen receptor you know, is a theme that comes up in all of these sorts of treatments. And basically, it's a competition to see which one is the most efficient at interfering with AR signaling. So tell us a little bit about, I'm just going to call it Cosmerna, whether that's right or not. Yes, yeah, so this affects something called siRNA, that's small interfering RNA. Just to rehash a bit of a background, um, going back to the analogy about the androgen receptor being the door and the androgen, whether it's DHT or testosterone, or a synthetic androgen like masterone or uh, other synthetic androgens, um, the stronger the androgenic activity in the hair follicle and also in the scalp, um, there is likely effect other than in the hair follicle, um, you will open that door. So this is going to interfere with the mRNA um, that is going to put that, uh, that's going to essentially uh, synthesize that protein and that protein is the androgen receptor so it's what makes the door so it's going to prevent the door from being in the cytoplasm to begin with so regardless of how much androgen you have around you're not going to activate that so in something like the scalp or the hair follicle that sounds great in other cells like muscle cells you probably don't want that so this is topical and theoretically it would just have a topical effect Hopefully. Yeah. Fingers crossed there. And it's interesting because it was applied once per week in the studies. So there seems to be some like duration of effect before it wears off. I, some people have speculated that you may be able to apply it monthly in the forums. You know, it's already being discussed, even though people are just now receiving shipments of this from South Korea. Yep. And the cost looks like it's around $100 a month is what I priced it at, plus shipping. And there's a import tax on it, things like that. So I don't think that I would be the one to say, well, I'm going to try it once per month because the increase was pretty small in terms of hair count. So you got about seven more hairs per square centimeter. It looks like these people had fairly good density to start. They weren't like Norwood 5 or or very advanced. Uh, But the peak effect was seen at 16 weeks. So if you get a four-month supply, and you try it, you're basically going to know whether it's working for you because from 16 weeks to 24 weeks, there really wasn't any further improvement. So overall, um, there was only two studies done. So I'm a little bit less bullish on this than something that has a lot of data, uh, which is probably why our first podcast both focused on the, the treatments that had the most data already out there. Yeah. That being said, certainly interesting that it's over the counter. Certainly interesting that it could have synergy with other hair loss treatments that it wouldn't, uh, you know, for example, prevent you from having a beneficial effect from uh, dutasteride mesotherapy, which there is now, if we haven't mentioned that on the podcast, there's pharmacies compounding sterile dutasteride. So um, contact our clinic for more info with that. Um, And also, uh, we should note, if you want more info diving into androgens, the androgen receptor, the sensitivity of the androgen receptor, the density of the androgen receptor, Check out our past podcasts on that information. Um, I think that's a pretty good summary of Cosmo RNA. We could move on to the next one, KX826. Just from the name, that sounds like it would have a very high efficacy. And probably no side effects. It almost sounds like a peptide. Correct. But um, it's not a peptide. It is a topical androgen receptor antagonist. So... Uh, This one was slightly more potent. It's uh, 0.5% in terms of the percentage of the medication being applied. Um, It was applied twice per day. And it looks slightly better in terms of the hair count, although we don't know what the baseline hair counts are. So it could be anywhere from 
you know, very good to only modestly effective. Yeah. So <laughs> you've got, you know, maybe 10 more hairs per square centimeter, maybe 15 more hairs per square centimeter. Um, supposedly the phase three trials are ongoing now for this product and they should be done by the end of the year, which is pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to these results and being able to see the actual study and who they selected and what their baseline Norwood score was. Because right now all we have is the the press releases. Yeah, it's and, a teaser trailer. Like yeah. for a movie, they release a couple different trailers and here's the highlights. Have Probably haven't released the lowlights yet. Um, also of note, this is the cousin of RU58841, being another topical androgen receptor antagonist. And it appears that is it is getting further in clinical trials than RU58841. So it does seem more promising. Um, also of note is that it did appear to have efficacy in females as well as males. Yeah, it's nice to see that there's more attention being drawn to androgenic alopecia that's not necessarily a strictly male pattern baldness, but that this can occur in females and tends to occur in females with age just like men. Mm -hmm. Um, next, we have a compound called GT20029, which also sounds very effective. Um, this one is the earliest on yeah, in terms of like the potential, like we don't know whether it's even working or not at this point. Mm -hmm. It's only been through phase one safety trials. So they put it on people's heads and people were okay. Um, but it's a really interesting mechanism. So it's a topical androgen receptor degrader. Um, and the even cooler way to say that is it's a proteolysis targeting chimera. Mm -hmm. a, a peptide adjuvant because it affects the breakdown of proteins, which are peptides. It's a peptide creating machine. Yeah. And endogenous peptide upregulator. Yeah. And it was also really interesting that in the literature talking about the development of this compound or basically this technology as a whole because in theory there's applications to more than just hair loss they described a protein targeting warhead hmm. so this is literally what will target the androgen receptor and degrade it so do you have androgenic alopecia why don't you nuke your androgen receptor couldn't have said it better myself <laughs> yeah it sounds very cool it also sounds a little bit scary if it does what it claims, and it has completed phase one safety trials as well, so um, that's pretty interesting. Presumably, it didn't degrade every androgen receptor in the body. So Presumably, this has been through phase one safety trials, but you always have to question, you know, like the dose and then the duration and then an individual mm -hmm. sensitivity with any kind of medication. So, yeah. the, the nice thing about this is, if it truly works, then it is extremely likely to be highly efficacious. So, in uh, in a lot of medications, you're really concerned about the efficacy, and a lot of them have dubious efficacy. But this one is likely to work where you're almost more concerned about the side effects. Yeah, yeah, there's a pendulum that sort of swings back and forth. You can make something that is incredibly effective, like cancer treatment, but then you're going to also kill the patient. Yeah. That's not good. And you can make things that are safe treatments, but that are not particularly effective. And I think it's nice to see all these multiple mechanisms coming together. It's very similar to what you see now in blood pressure management or diabetes, where it's like a little bit of each vector yep. goes a longer way with a better side effect profile than just mega dosing something or you know, drinking liquid monoxidil like some kids are doing now. But don't do that. Yeah, that's a good summary. Uh, for a lot of conditions, including hair loss, the best uh, regimen of the best protocol is likely multiple different vectors. Um, that being said, uh, I'm hoping that there is no post warhead syndrome in the future. That would be an interesting PWS. One. Yeah, PWS, post warhead yeah. syndrome. So now our next one, HMI 115. I'll bet this is another androgen receptor interfering technology. Not quite. Um, surprisingly enough, it works on the prolactin receptor. And in fact, it is an antagonist. I would think, you know, high prolactin states like uh, pregnancy or breastfeeding. Well, not so much breastfeeding, but pregnancy. That makes sense. Women do lose hair when they're breastfeeding. Yep. Certainly doesn't have anything to do with the estradiol levels going from 3000 to below 50, yeah. does it? Or the high incidence of hypothyroidism and euthyroid 6 syndrome. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, um, 
And you think of uh, prolactin to be pretty correlated with estrogen, lots of estrogen, good hair quality, but it appears that this prolactin receptor inhibitor um, has some good anecdotal evidence, which we have some reports up here. We do. We have the documents. Yep. So here's our insider information and some info from the trials. Um, this is a phase, has had phase one and I believe possibly phase two, but this anecdote was from phase one. Two sets of phase one data because they're pursuing a approval for endometriosis and also for androgenic alopecia. Mm -hmm. So I believe the phase one for androgenic alopecia is going on in Australia. And that is where our yeah. informant, who also informed the rest of the internet, but also informed us yes. of what happened to them during phase one. Yep. So the Bayer trial is for curing endometriosis. So prolactin inhibitor, prolactin receptor inhibitor makes a lot of sense for endometriosis. We talk about IGF-1, estrogen, and prolactin as all inputs for that. But even despite that, the Australian government wouldn't let them extrapolate results for safety and efficacy. Stage one is an efficacy and safety trial. All right, sounds about right. right. Stage two will have a placebo control group. I don't know why, probably to minimize researcher bias. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, a layperson, um, I guess, theorizing about why the phases of trials are a certain way, they should check out our clinical research podcast. They should. Um, lots of info on phase one, two, three, and then uh, post-marketing data, aka phase four. But um, anyway, this individual also mentions, or a different individual says, I mean, from what I can tell looking at other clinical trials like KX826 or the GT229 we just talked about, they either have placebo in phase one, two, or three, or they don't. <laughs> well, that is extremely accurate. And Correct. that's probably my favorite line from the document. <laughs> I, I do love that. Um, in phase one, usually they, they don't have placebo. And then in the other phases, they usually do have placebo because placebo controlled trial is extremely useful when you're uh, assessing efficacy and also side effects. So um, let's see, we could probably skip that. Um, but of note here, the commenter mentioned that it had taken this individual from a Norwood 4 to either a Norwood 3 or 2. And I think it was just a matter of uh, eight, yep, 18 weeks in and already almost filled the vertex and a whole bunch of baby hairs in the front scalp. We also like to call those deutasteride hairs. Because often you do see that when you're on um, something that's efficacious. Yeah. So this is, you know, this is all alleged. There's no real proof that this person was enrolled in the phase one trial. But it does seem particularly credible given that there were posts that were made over like several months time. And that this improvement over 18 weeks seems to make sense and fit with what you would see in someone who is like taking another treatment like a dutasteride, mm -hmm. for example where you would see kind of a slowly filling in and then more baby hairs coming in over a, a long time frame. It's not something that's going to happen in four weeks. So mm -hmm. I, I suspect this is less a company trying to like drum up interest in the drug and more so just, you know, serendipitously someone happened to be a user of like social media and yeah. happened to be in the trial and was putting this information out there. If any of you are in various trials, Feel free to message us confidentially or publicly and let us know how things are going. Reading this, uh, I'd say, makes me more excited than the trailer for the new season of The Bachelor. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. And then uh, last but not least, uh, we have a commercially available androgen receptor antagonist that you probably didn't know about. Or if you knew about it, you probably didn't know it was a androgen receptor antagonist. And nope. Uh, you brought this to my attention at least a year ago, I think, when the initial approval came through. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have Win Levi or topical clascoderone. Uh, right now, it's being used to treat acne at, to the tune of about a thousand bucks a tube. Yep. Um, but it does interfere with the androgen receptor, which is involved in the production of acne, or at least that pathophysiology. And in theory, this should work for androgenic alopecia as well. I think they're looking at a higher potency. I don't know for sure, yep. but it's going to be the same drug just a foam. in a different um, vehicle for androgenic alopecia specifically. One of the proposed names, or maybe it was the European name, is Breezula. 
mm. but it's still just topical class codrone. And again, this is similar, uh, as we mentioned before, to RU58841. So that's kind of the third topical androgen receptor antagonist. Um, it's nice because we can actually see the phase two and phase three data for this, at least from the Win Levi perspective, where for whatever reason for RU58841, which has been studied and been abandoned, it the trial is complete and they have the data, but it is not published. Yeah, the it's really a misfortune. The RU seemed quite effective in stump-tailed macaques, but Apparently, it was not effective enough in humans for them to bring it to market. Mm -hmm. Another thing of note with class codrone is despite being approved for acne and specifically androgenic acne, it is difficult to get covered. Even if you have both acne and your acne happens to be in the area of your scalp where you also have alopecia. Um, with the acne, it does not seem to have as good of efficacy as you would think, for example, someone with PCOS. Um, or someone that's sensitive to androgens that has acne, likely because there's there's other reasons like your skin microbiome, see our uh, podcast with Dr. Thomas Hitchcock for that and his Zycrobe, um, topical skin microbiome, um, also sebum production, it's not going to completely control for that, uh, estrogenic inputs, sweating, there's a lot of th even pressure and friction. There's a lot of things other than just androgen receptor activity even in androgenic acne, even if it's like classic jawline or whatnot, um, the results have been okay, but usually somewhat underwhelming if you're using it as a monotherapy. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be a magic bullet. I mean, people are probably going to be stacking this with traditional methods like you know, retinoids, you know, calming down inflammation, restoring insulin sensitivity, um, and maybe topical antibiotics here and there. Um, like you said, like we talked about earlier, having a little bit of each mechanism involved tends to lead to the best outcome. Even if not every one of the treatments is a home run, you can still get a really good effect by adding a little bit of each thing. Yeah. Um, I guess of all these compounds, would we add any to our main, like our big three hair loss stack? Or maybe we got to at least add the new warhead to our nuclear hair loss stack. To the nuclear protocol. Yeah. You could, in theory, add in a antagonist, a warhead, and, a de well, the warhead is the degrader. You can add in an antagonist, a... Prolactin re receptor inhibitor or antagonist. Yeah, that you can add sense. in a interfering RNA. Yep. You could add in the prolactin and then pick the best antagonist, and that's your nuclear hair loss stack. Mm -hmm. But... Technically, none of these would be non-hormonal treatments, as we did outline a non-hormonal protocol. So this would be for someone, in theory, you could use all of these and not interfere with DHT, provided that things are not going systemic. So people that are like, well, I'll do anything, but I won't touch my DHT. In theory, they could use all of these treatments. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of promise and soon you'd think at least one or two of these will get approval status. So just like in obesity medicine, we're very excited for um, the clinical trials and hopefully future approvals for these. And hopefully we'll understand the side effects a bit faster than we did for the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. That being said, for your average individual, especially if they're willing to get labs, in the long run, especially if you look at the trial over eight to 10 years and you have improvements even up to eight years and most low Norwood scores, it is going to be difficult to beat uh, topical or oral 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. Yeah, there's sort of the you know old reliable in terms of most people are going to get results, but does that mean it can save everyone's hair? Probably not. Some people are just incredibly prone to androgenic alopecia. Uh, there's a lot of variability. It's a very heterogeneous uh, condition. But mm -hmm. uh, we've got phase three coming out for KX826 this year. So yep. if anyone, like, like you said, if anyone's in a clinical trial or anyone is aware of any other compounds that we should look into, um, please let us know. Send us a message, uh, leave a comment, and thank you for watching.